Join me on the tennis court. With sweat on our foreheads, we look over the edge of the net at our opponent. In a few seconds, he will serve and is only two points short of winning the match. We know all our opponent's game statistics inside out, and we know that 80% of his serves land flat in the middle of the court. That's what we prepare for. Our opponent throws the ball up, swings his racket and poof, hits the ball. But contrary to our expectations, the ball fly way to the side and lands on the line. We stay rooted to the spot and lose this valuable point. It's match point. We have to win the next ball exchange, otherwise our match is over. Where will our opponent hit his ball the next time? In tennis and in many other sports, agility is one of the most important skills to win. It is the skill to react very quickly to unforeseen and uncontrollable stimuli. So it is precisely the same skill that many of our companies also need to survive in a rapidly changing and unpredictable world. More and more companies want to base their decisions on data. So they want to tackle that problem with data. I'm here today to challenge that dogma. I'm here today to tell you that quite often you're better off making your decisions with less data. Today I want to show you how our desire to always rely on data undermines or risks our agility. And I want to do that by taking you through a drama with three acts. Now, let's, stage, let's set the stage for this drama. What is data anyway? Data is a collection of measurements or observations. It is a set of data about one or more people, objects or situations. We undoubtedly live in an age of data. It's often referred to as the gold or oil of our times. And it is breathtaking how much the collection of data is increasing year by year. But now ask ourselves, what is data not? Data is not a direct reflection of reality or truth. How do I arrive at that statement? Isn't the word facts often used in combination with data? Yes, unfortunately. Let's get into our first act of the drama, equating data with facts. Equating data with facts is a very dangerous simplification. Even if the data is based on real measurement. Let me point out how many difficulties and weaknesses measurement has to contend with. This is John. Now, John wants to measure that bottle. Don't ask me why he wants to measure that bottle. Now, the only measuring instrument he has at his disposal is this foldable ruler. It's an instrument he hasn't used very often, but he uses that anyway. What will he measure? I guess he will measure the height and the width of the bottle. Will he be accurate at doing that? I guess not. It's not the perfect measuring instrument to measure the, the width of this bottle. But he will get some results anyhow. Now, what won't he measure? I guess he won't measure the circumference, the weight, the volume, the light transmission, the material stiffness, and many, many properties more. Now let's assume that he also wants to measure the second bottle. But this time, it's even harder to measure the width of the bottle. He will measure at some different parts and then calculate an average from that. He will receive a value this time as well, but it will be even more a rough approximation of reality. Now I ask John, what do you try to find out by measuring the two bottles? And he tells me, well, I want to prove that the first bottle can hold more water than the second bottle. Aha, John has a preconceived notion. What do you think he will find out? If his data does not completely contradict his expectations, I guess that his cognitive bias the well-known confirmation bias, will ensure that he will definitely find out that the first bottle holds more water than the second bottle. Now, I know this is a very simplified example, but I want to show you that measurement consists of many different parts, and they're all very important for a good result. It's like, who is measuring? And is this person or machine even capable of measuring accurately? 
What is the objective of the measurement, and does this objective influence the results? What measuring instruments are we using? And is this instrument even appropriate to the task? What are we measuring? And can this thing even be measured accurately? What are we not measuring, but would still be important to measure? What references do we have to compare our results? And in what context do we consider the results? You see, there are many things that can go wrong. Now, let's return to John, because this time he wants to measure something else. He wants to measure, let's say, the innovative strength of his company. So that's a complex system. Good luck, John. A complex system consists of many different individual parts that are constantly changing and interact with each other. So that means that even small distortions of the system or minimal differences in the initial condition will lead to completely different results. Moreover, complex systems are open, so they're also interacting with its environment. They are context-dependent. So to measure complex systems, it's basically impossible. What will he do? He will most probably measure some parts of the system, the parts that he can measure, and he will ignore all the parts that he can't measure, or he just doesn't know they exist. And this actually reminds me of a joke that I have been taught by my father when I was a small boy. The joke goes something like this. Imagine that it's a dark night. The security guard is making his rounds through the city park, as he does every night. And luckily, the lantern is shining every 100 meters, because otherwise he wouldn't see anything in this moonless night. Now he turns around the corner, and he sees a silhouette kneeling in the cone of a light. He walks over to that silhouette and sees that it's an elderly gentleman scanning the ground for something. He asks him, excuse me, sir, are you looking for something? Can I be of any assistance? With relief on his face, the man looks up and says, oh yes, please, I'm looking for my expensive watch. So the security guard also kneels down and starts searching the ground for that expensive watch. After about 10 minutes, he asks the man, um, where did you lose your watch? And with an outstretched index finger, the man points out to the darkness and says, over there in the meadows. And why are we looking for a watch right here? Well, we have light here. Over there, we wouldn't recognize anything. See, if we try to measure something like a complex system, or actually anything, we're always measuring the things that we can measure, and we ignore the things that we can't measure or we forget about. So we're always looking for the watch in the cone of light, knowing or unknowing that the watch may be somewhere in the darkness. Measurement always adds values to the things that can be measured, and subtracts value from the things that can't be measured. And this leads to distortions. Now, does this mean that we have simply not yet learned how to cut the diamond called data well enough? What if we could manage to actually really measure even complex systems accurately? Would it then make sense to base our decisions on data? Welcome to Act 2. The future is not a linear continuation of the past. Donald Rumsfeld made the concept of unknown unknowns popular with his 2002 speech at the Pentagon news briefing. He used that concept to describe events that no one had thought of, but that would have a big impact. And we all spend a lot of time in our daily lives dealing with such unknown unknowns, with such events that pop out of nowhere. And yet, if you look at how we think about business, strategy, and decision-making, we often assume that the future is predictable. We assume that we just need more data, better processes, smarter models, smarter strategy, better frameworks, etc. But that is a big mistake. Because even if all our data was perfectly measured, the future would remain unpredictable. Now, why is our belief that the future is predictable so strongly embedded in our thinking? I think it has to do with the peculiarity that we're always smarter in hindsight. That's a so-called hindsight bias, that if you look at what happened, you think you can explain why it happened, 
And from that, you think that you just, you should have been smarter or better informed to know what will happen. From that, we conclude that we should be able to predict the future today if we just had better data. But with data, we don't make predictions. We extrapolate. That's not the same. An extrapolation is an estimate based on the extension of a known sequence of values. And it assumes that the external conditions remain the same. So this means that if you extrapolate, you ignore all the unknown unknowns. You cannot count them in. But the unknown unknowns are what makes the future so unpredictable. So, of course, not everything that lies in the future is completely random and chaotic. There are things that are reliable. And with the help of data, we are expanding the field of reliable future events. But, and this is a big but, can we predict the important <laughs> things? Can we predict the things that have the biggest impact? With that question, I herald the final act of our drama, the law of large numbers. The law of large numbers says that if you have a large amount of data, the result, or the, 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 um, the result of that data, or the, um, yeah, the result of that data will, will be close to an expected value. So like in this graph right here, we have any topic, like the birth rates of boys and girls, and the more data you have, the more it gets close to an expected value. So this means, in turn, that if you have a large amount of data, coincidences and outliers will hardly play a role anymore. But coincidences are what makes each story, each small sample so unique. So conversely, we could say that small events, individual events, will differ quite greatly from the result of the many measurements. Let me make an example with the chart right here. You see, it has long been known that the sex ratio at birth is different for boys and girls. There are slightly more boys born year after year than girls. 51% boys, 49% girls. Now, those are the big numbers, the large numbers. What preparation or decisions can my wife and I derive from that? We as a small number? Well, none. Two months ago, I've been blessed with a girl for the second time. We don't have 51% boys, we have zero. <laughs> now, when the curtain falls on this last act of this drama, the question arises whether we should dispense with data altogether for decision-making. Of course, we shouldn't. Data is for an organization what vision and sight is for us humans. But while vision takes up the largest part of our brain, of all our senses, it wouldn't be wise to just and only rely on vision. Our eyes can deceive us. And when it's dark around us, it wouldn't be smart to just look for the cone of light and stay there, because the watch could be somewhere in the darkness. So my recommendation, therefore, is that if you think about relying your decision too much on data, ask yourself three questions. For the first act, ask yourself how confident you are that the data you're using is accurately measured and represents an important part of an overall picture. If you're not very sure, decide without that data. For the second act, ask yourself how confident you are that the unknown unknowns won't severely disrupt the linear continuation of the past. If you're not very sure, decide without that data. And for the third act, ask yourself how confident you are that the result of the large numbers have a significance for you as a small number. If you're not very sure, then decide without that data. See, data makes us believe that it represents the whole truth, but it doesn't. And if you think that you know where your opponent is going to hit his ball the next time at match point, you won't be quick enough to react to an unexpected shot. So return with me to the tennis court. Your opponent is one point short of winning the match. But this time, you forget about all the statistics you've learned. You concentrate on the moment. 
you sharpen all your senses on what your opponent is about to do. And he throws the ball up, swings his racket, and bam! But this time, the ball flies unusually slow and lands right after the net in our field. We run towards the net, and we catch the ball just in time. But our opponent is already waiting over there, and he returns the ball in a high arc to the back line. We have to run to the back, and zack! We catch it so skillfully that it lands unreasonable on our opponent's field. Point blocked, and we're back in the game. 